If I asked you to list the world building ingredients essential for creating a lively fictional world, you'd probably fill a whole piece of paper. But I bet that as thorough as your list is, Arcane's world building secrets wouldn't be on it. At least they weren't for me until now. Disclosure, I have never once played League of Legends. Hell, I have never even watched someone else play. And given the history of video game adaptions, I came at Arcane with a bar so low that even I couldn't trip over it. That's a short joke, not a clumsy joke. So imagine my utter flabbergastery when I, with absolutely no knowledge of the fictional universe, characters, or even tone, took all of three episodes to declare Arcane my favorite TV show of all time. If you can't imagine, I'll give you a visual reenactment. The prophecy is true. And because I'm me, I proceeded to spend weeks trying to figure out why. Most of the answers were because Arcane is fucking awesome. But one answer eluded me. Why am I so attached to a world that I know so little about? A world that ignored most of what I consider to be world building rules. And then it finally clicked. The secret to Arcane's captivating world building isn't world building at all. At least not in the way that we're used to. It isn't the magic system or tech that we know next to nothing about. It isn't the barely touched upon history or unique species or foods or legal systems. No, I propose to you that the secret to a captivating story world revolves not around the world at all, but around the characters. So here are the four ways that Arcane crafts a lively world by casting traditional world building aside. taste of world building we get from Arcane starts approximately 17 seconds into episode 1, and it's so wrought by emotion that you probably missed it. Though I bet the information made it into your brain nonetheless. Powder's song not only conveys a sense of tone and theme, but it immediately provides economic class information that is pivotal to the story. The song is fleeting, the information vague, and yet it conveys everything it needs to. And all will never once feeling like world building. The show is full of moments like this, where the world building is so thoroughly framed within a powerful emotion or scene that we look at it not as information at all, but simply as art. From the mundane to the world shifting, all of the information we're handed is tethered to a character and mood. I think this is most obvious if you pay close attention to when we're first handed the names of places, ideas, and objects. For writers, it's sort of instinctual to name an element before defining it, especially since we spend half of the day looking up definitions to common words, just in case we forgot the meaning of them. It's easy to forget that words are just a tool of communication and should thus always come second to the meaning they're meant to convey. Arcane trusts the audience to remember concepts without a name to pair with it. And this naturally leads us to link the definitions to our feelings, which in turn creates stronger memories since that's just how the human brain is wired. So when we finally are handed a word, it becomes simply that, a word. And as such, it can be forgotten without negatively impacting the story or our memories of it. For example, the first time we're handed a name for this dark underground area is when Vander says, Welcome to the Lanes. It's one of the shortest instances of reveal to name delay, but that's because it gets some special treatment. You see, this line is preceded by the show's first integrated music video, which, aside from just feeling stupidly satisfying, uses the line, as a placeholder onto which it attached a bucket full of emotion. And then the location name is delivered right after the dialogue. This is vile. And Vander's. You'll learn to love it. Then 
And only then does the show give a name to the folder in our brain that's already brimming with imagery, associations, and feelings. On the more extreme side of time separation, we have Hextech and Shimmer. The words crystal, magic, and Hextech, for example, aren't mentioned until the second episode, at which point we already associate them with wonder, danger, and accidents. Shimmer makes an appearance in episodes one and two in scenes with characters who know its name, and yet, the audience isn't given a name for it until episode three, at which point we've associated it with violence, power, and the biological, via scenes that carried a strong sense of foreboding and fear. Locations, items, concepts, roles, over and over again, the names and details of world building elements are given only once we've been exposed to that element in a character bound and impactful way, forever binding these ideas to powerful emotions. And because of these colorful lenses, repeated world building exposure is never boring because each vocal character adds a new layer of color and complexity. For example, enforcers are initially presented within the frame of fear, rage, and death. But later, we see them through a more balanced lens that is Vander's interaction with Grayson. Then we have Caitlyn's lens of respect and Silco's use of them as tools. Each character sees the role in a different light and casts it in a different emotion. Each lens left in place just long enough for us to adjust before the next one is introduced, letting us truly appreciate the shifts. This allows a steady buildup of color that is never overwhelming and yet ultimately results in such a vibrant sense of these world building elements that they legitimately start to take on character of their own. Building elements feel more alive than others, and there's an even deeper reason for that than simple framing. Because the most vibrant world building elements in this story are actually mirrors of the characters themselves. Take, for example, Hextech and Shimmer, our two most pivotal world building elements. Hextech is represented by Blue and was created with the intention of helping and healing, but in the end, is used as a weapon. Shimmer was created to be a weapon, to be power in the hands of its wielder, and yet throughout the story we see it used to heal and help more often than harm. And when Victor tries to use Hextech to heal himself, he's only able to do it with the aid of Shimmer, and in the absence of Shimmer to stabilize the Hextech, a life is lost. Sound familiar yet? Here's another hint. Hextech is represented by Blue, and Shimmer is represented by this pink that's almost purple. What's the word for that color again? Right, it's violet. These critical world building elements are, at their core, a mirror and representation of Jinx and Vi. I can help them. We need to fight back. No, it was a mistake. I've got these and you've got those. Jinx tried to help, but ultimately causing harm, wanting to make devices to save and entertain, but accidentally creating deadly weapons, and then leaning into it. And Vi focused on strength and hungry to attack, but ultimately finding herself more effective in the role of protector. And it's in the absence of Vi's support that Jinx becomes unstable, a weapon she never intended to be. Where should I sit? That's your choice, really. This point is further driven home when Jace, with his good intentions, supplies Vi with the gauntlet she uses as a weapon. I'm not a vigilante. No, you're a victim. And Silco, with his bad intentions, uses Shimmer to save Jinx's life. And so even as Hextech and Shimmer add depth to the arcs of these central characters, the characters themselves breathe life into these two pivotal world building elements. And it is truly like breathing, because not only is everything in the story connected, but it's in constant movement, an ebb and flow, a breath and a heartbeat. This world feels alive because it is always shifting and with a chaos and unpredictability sourced straight from characters who are themselves full of life. Which brings us to the next element. The most important element to a lively world is movement. And movement is born of change. 
I'm sure you've heard complaints before about passive protagonists and antagonists. Of course you have, it's the quickest way to a dull story. But reviewers will rarely go so far as to complain about passive side characters. Why? Because it's damn hard to juggle a cast full of active characters. Arcane, Cirque de Soleil's this beat. From the poster champions all the way down to those whose names we can't quite remember, the characters of this story push and pull the world around them, as well as each other. Like a rainbow of painted ping pong balls dropped into a white box, every impact imparts color, changes trajectories, and leaves a permanent mark. It's chaos, but it's contained. It's unpredictable, but it never feels random. It's honestly, I'm struggling to put into words the degree of just pure character art that is painted across the canvas that is arcane. And to my utter surprise, this chaotic clashing resulted in beautifully impactful interactions between characters that I couldn't even picture together prior to a scene. Their actions were so heavily tinted by their lens that it took this side by side for me to see that they were the same picture in fundamental ways. And then I started to see it everywhere, over and over again. Characters encounter each other without introduction or needless justifications, and in their meeting, I found parallels I never would have seen otherwise. The writer anxiety in me flares at the thought of these seemingly out of the blue encounters. And yet, in practice, it leads directly to a sense that this is a real world, populated with real people who continue to live and breathe even when the camera turns away. Because the audience doesn't need to see every string and get every answer. Which brings us to the last critical element to Arcane's lively world. treated as the backdrop that it is meant to be. After all, we consume media for the characters, the events, the experiences, not for the fine details. Arcane never forgets this. And so, vibrant and detailed as the background world is, and holy hell is it vibrant and detailed, it's left always out of focus. This adds essential depth to the story, but all while never distracting from the core element of the art piece which is, of course, characters. This is accomplished via the agonizing act of cutting away world-building details that most writers, me included, tend to deem essential. What is the green stuff that powers the machinery in the target range? What sorts of unique humanoid species exist in this world? How does magic work? Where did it come from? How does the hex gate work? Where does Jace get the crystals? We don't know, and ultimately, it doesn't matter. The show instead spends its precious time on the parts of the story that deeply affect us, the parts that matter and carry true meaning. The bridge isn't just a bridge. It represents the bridge between the two cities and the link between the conflicting worlds. The toy, the enforcer's masks, the training machines, the fighting glove, the dummies, hell, even Savika's mechanical arm isn't just a show of tech. She was Vander's right-hand lady and literally loses an arm while saving Silco from a Hextech blast created by Jinx. Her replacement arm is then powered by Shimmer and is ultimately destroyed by Vi using her Hextech-powered gauntlet. Nothing is wasted. When writers spend a lot of time crafting a world, it's so easy to view every detail as essential because we fall in love with every detail. We want the audience to see every string, every gear, spinning within the complex mechanism that is this world we created. But although some people are intrigued by these inner workings, the vast majority aren't. And though filtering out and discarding creative elements is one of the hardest parts of being a creator, it's worth it for the sake of the story. You see this look on my face? This will always mean it's time to shut up. But I... And so in conclusion... I think that I've been looking at world building all wrong. I've been viewing world building and character development as two separate mechanisms that, when combined, form a greater whole. Like two types of brushes intended for the same canvas. 
But the truth is, they aren't equal, and to treat them as such is to sacrifice the core of story itself. Yes, you can absolutely make an art piece with just paint and canvas, but I believe, now, the story can take on a whole other dimension of life, when instead we treat the characters as models onto which the world building is painted. After all, characters are pivotal to the story. World building, on the other hand, is simply the flair, the decoration, and the backdrop. And sure, this method requires that writers sacrifice some of the finer details and work in broader strokes. And yes, the result will be messier, more difficult to work with, and harder to maintain. But what better way to capture and represent life than something just as messy? Now, it might come as a surprise to you, but I am not the ultimate authority on Storycraft. But I am the ultimate authority on how Arcane made me feel as an audience member. And so I can confidently say that as both a writer and an audience member, I prefer world building that's painted onto a face. If you, like me, love character-driven stories full of morally grand complex casts splattered in world building, go grab Aletheia. I wrote the book I wanted to read and Arcane now holds the title of my favorite show of all time. So basically, if you liked Arcane, there's a high chance that you will like Aletheia. Shout out to my patrons for keeping this channel alive when I neglect it for months on end. And that was it for this video. Take